from Stanford. Yeah, hi. Hello. Good morning, everyone from California. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. We can hear you. So you can start. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, so I'm now a postdoc at the lab of Alison Marston at Stanford. But what I'm going to present today is part of my PhD work in, at TU Munich in the group of uh, Wolfgang Wall. And this is joint work with uh, Radek Kabinjok from Indria and Cristobal Bertolio um, from the University of Groningen. And yeah, so today, uh, like my whole talk is dedicated to um, pericardial boundary conditions. And I want to start today with um, a popular example of how the heart does not work, um, which you find in many places all over the internet is, um, uh, so this one is taken from Wikipedia. And you can see that the atrioventricular plane remains uh, motionless throughout, this, um, throughout the cardiac cycle. Um, but the apex moves uh, throughout the cardiac cycle, and you can also see this radial inward squeezing motion. Um, but if you look at an actual cine MRI of the heart, um, you can see that the movement of the heart is actually reversed as shown in this um, animation. So the atrioventricular plane actually moves downward towards the apex during um, systole. Uh, we can see that the apex almost remains motionless throughout the cardiac cycle. And we can see that the outer shape of the heart remains more or less constant throughout the cardiac cycle. And um, if you uh, look at other publications, uh, so we actually know that the left ventricular diameter only shortens about two millimeters during contraction. And even though the, heart, the left ventricle ejects 65% of its blood in each heartbeat, um, the total volume of the heart only changes by five to eight percent. Um, so the volume of the heart as a total remains almost constant throughout the cardiac cycle. And that basically means that as the heart is contracting, blood is shifted between the atrium and the ventricle. And there's a nice um, publication by Maxuti and others who uh, compared this to a piston unit that is basically shifting blood between the atrium and the ventricle. Um, while the valves are operating. Um, and one reason for that cardiac motion is the pericardium that's on the outside of the heart. So here we see a dissection of the heart and what's cut open here is um, part of the pericardium. Um, and it has two functions. So one, it provides frictionless sliding, um, but it also constrains diastolic and systolic movement and keeps the heart in place. Um, so if you take a closer look at the anatomy, we can see that the pericardium consists of two layers. So the blue layer is the serous pericardium that has been compared in literature to a deflated air balloon where the myocardium is pressed into like a fist. And on the outside, we have the fibrous pericardium. Um, and the fibrous pericardium and the serous pericardium are attached. And the serous pericardium on the other side is also attached to the myocardium. And in between, we have a thin film of fluid. And also, like, there were several people who looked at the role of this fluid. Um, so the first publication um, from the 60s here um, looked at um, how pericardial pressure changes as the um, volume of liquid inside the pericardial cavity um, increases. And you can see that the pericardial pressure remains constant for a or remains zero for a very long time until it suddenly rises sharply. And that was one indication um, that there's actually a, a large potential space that can be filled up with fluid, but is not filled up during normal cardiac um, operation. Another experiment was um, people injected dye close to the apex and then observed after 15 minutes how this dye had uh, distributed. And it was found that it is only contained in the um, intraventricular and atrioventricular growths. Um, which was an indication that there's in fact only a thin film of fluid um, on, the, on the surface between the epicardium and the pericardium as contrasted to um, being there like a, a large fluid that has some role in load balancing. Um, and when analyzing the actual composition of the fluid, it was found that it's pretty similar um, to the pleural fluid. Um, and so all these observations um, lead more or less to the conclusion that the pericardial fluid is not really a load balancing mechanism, 
but it provides um, boundary lubrication. And in order to model that, um, so first of all, we used a, we created a patient specific uh, four chamber cardiac model to look into the pericardial boundary condition. And um, the way we modeled it, which was first published by Mark Hirschvogel in 2017, is by a spring and dashboard in parallel acting in normal direction to the surface. So that basically models that frictionless sliding in the tangential plane and the viscoelastic support in the uh, normal direction. And we compared that to a boundary condition that is also commonly chosen in cardiac mechanics, namely that we fixate the apex with, um, with um, somewhat stiffer omnidirectional springs in a dashboard. And when we compare cardiac contraction, so we have here um, the Cine MRI from our healthy volunteer, and we compare that to the contraction as predicted by our mechanical model on the left um, with the boundary conditions only at the apex and on the right with the boundary conditions um, at the whole pericardium. Uh, at first, you might not notice a big difference, but if you look at the um, outer shape of the heart at the uh, epicardium, you can see that if we only fixate the heart at the apex, we see this radial inward movement, and we also see less uh, atrioventricular plane displacement that we would see on the MRI. And on the other hand, with the pericardial boundary conditions, we see this nice sliding on uh, the epicardial surface, and we also see like a slightly improved um, atrioventricular plane displacement as the heart contracts. So if that's and so just to highlight that again, um, so that's just we, from the MRI, we picked the frame um, at peak systole and we compare it to the simulation that is sliced at the same plane. And then again on the left, if you just fixate the simulation at the apex, we can see that um, we see this radial inward movement that we do not get when with the pericardial boundary conditions. So with the pericardial boundary conditions, um, MRI and simulation match nicely at end of an epicardium. Um, so you might argue that uh, even though the bounding conditions are very different, um, the kinematics look somewhat similar in that case, um, but they have very different stresses on the boundary. So in the case um, of the fixated apex, um, we can see that uh, if we average those stresses in, in this small region where, where we apply the boundary condition, we can see that the contract stress goes up to like 600 millimeters of mercury, which is way above um, the level of left ventricular pressure. And we would not expect to happen to experience those high pressure levels uh, in reality. Uh, on the other hand, in the case of the pericardium, we can see that the contract stress, um, again, averaged over the whole pericardium in this case, um, is um, in between minus and plus uh, 20 millimeters of mercury um, on average, which matches um, experimental observations um, of pericardial contact stress uh, on the outside. Uh, so we see that stresses are at a more reasonable and physiological level, and also they are more evenly distributed on the whole surface, surface where we apply this boundary condition. Um, and in my talk, I also want to um, highlight some uh, nice um, publications um, by other groups as well. So um, one publication I want to highlight is the work by Thomas Blitz and others uh, from 2014, um, which is, at least to our knowledge, like the first publication that specifically looked at uh, myocardial and pericardial interaction. And so they modeled the pericardium and the surrounding tissue by um, uh, a so solid wall on the outside and they have a contact interaction between um, the neighboring tissue and the myocardium itself. And they also compared simulations with and without pericardium. And you basically see a similar observation, namely um, that the pericardial boundary condition increases atrioventricular plane displacement and matches the observation from uh, MRI better. And also without the pericardial boundary condition, um, so in blue you can see here uh, the uh, outer shape of the ventricles and the atria from MRI. And you see without pericardial boundary condition, you also get this more radial involved uh, contraction of the myocardium. Um, another interesting recent work is by uh, Ponaluri and others. 
uh, from 2019, and they looked at um, only the left ventricle. So this work could be interesting if you're also looking into um, single, single ventricle simulations. And they model the pericardium as a flexible elastic membrane around the myocardium. And they also compared that to MRI and um, get a good agreement um, when they include the pericardial boundary condition in their uh, simulation. And they compared um, that to the case of a pinned base. Um, so that's also similar to the uh, animation from Wikipedia I showed in the beginning, namely that the atrioventricular plane is fixed throughout the cardiac cycle. And then again, you get this more radial inward contraction that doesn't match uh, with the MRI. Um, and in an even more recent um, publication by Strachi and others, um, they also looked at a four chamber cardiac simulation where they modeled the pericardium also as a spring in normal direction. Um, and an interesting aspect they included in their work is um, they used a variable stiffness for the pericardial boundary condition. So the stiffness of this boundary condition is highest at the apex and smoothly um, transitions to zero at the basal plane. Um, and again, they also compared simulations with pericardial boundary condition and without pericardial boundary condition to observations from uh, MRI. And they also found that when you include the pericardial boundary condition, kinematics match the MRI much better. And again, without the pericardial boundary condition, you exactly see what we saw in the first animation, namely that the atrioventricular plane remains more or less motionless throughout the cardiac cycle and the apex moves towards the base and the ventricles uh, contract radially inward. Um, yeah, so I'm very happy about, um, about these uh, recent publications that also looked into uh, the pericardial boundary conditions. Um, and yeah, that already leads me to my uh, summary. Namely, um, when we are validating um, simulations of cardiac mechanics, it's not sufficient to compare zero D parameters like um, left ventricular volume or left ventricular pressure, but it's also necessary to uh, actually look at the motion from MRI because you might still match those zero D quantities, but you will have, but at the same time have kinematics that are very different from what you would see in MRI. And I think um, we can conclude that pericardial boundary conditions, no matter how they are implemented, either as a co um, contact interaction problem or just as a spring condition on the outside of the heart, uh, they are essential to predict not only the right kinematics, but also the right stresses within the heart, which is very important if you want to look in models of uh, growth and remodeling it's very important to not only match the kinematics as in reality, but also the stresses. And depending on um, how much computational effort you want to spend on your pericardial boundary conditions, there are several different variants um, that also that, that all give you a somewhat good approximation um, of, of this interaction, um, but at the, are at the same time computationally affordable. Um, and what we would like to do in the future would be to not only validate um, the boundary conditions with CINDA MRI, as we have done, but also with 3 detect MRI, where we actually can track the movement of the myocardium and compare it to the simulation. And also, it would be, would be nice to have measurements of pericardial um, contact pressure on the epicardium at different locations uh, to also compare that to the output of the simulation. Yeah, and with that, uh, I have arrived at the end of my talk and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Martin, for your talk. And in case, okay, we have first question by Ivan Fumagalli. Please, Ivan. Uh, thank you for your interesting talk. I do have a question on yeah. the comparison that you showed uh, between your simulation and the MRI. And in particular, it looked to me there is, there is some difference uh, uh, between the left and the right heart in terms mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, let's say, effectiveness of your simulation. Can you yeah. comment on the difference between the two parts of the heart and if you have, uh, uh, let's say, some reason why this happened? Yeah. Um, so one hypothesis that we had um, is, so we used one uniform parameter of the stiffness for the whole um, epicardial surface. 
And so we think that in some places we are overestimating the actual stiffness and in some places we are underestimating the actual stiffness. Um, and I think maybe one explanation could be that um, with, with a regionally distributed pericardial stiffness, um, you would match that right part of the heart better. Okay, um, and not just not just difference between left and right, but also the difference between uh, atria mm -hmm. and ventricles. And that's basically what um, the, uh, the publication I showed at the end by Strachey and others did, um, that they looked at a regionally varying stiffness. Thank you very much. There is a, a question, or better, a suggestion in the in the chat by Yusuf. Um, suggestion for future work: you can potentially try to model constrictive pericarditis (CP), which could lead to heart failure. Um, yeah, this could be interesting. Um, and there is a further question from Eder Medina, unless you want to comment further on the previous suggestion. Uh, no, uh, we can go to the next one. Yeah. Okay. So the, um, the question is, can you comment on variation in stress distribution due to boundary conditions? Okay, so um, like in this, uh, like related to boundary conditions in general. Um, so if we just apply boundary conditions at the apex, um, so basically, the natural movement of the heart, if it's not constrained at all, the apex would move towards the base throughout the cardiac contraction. But if we like artificially constrain it by just fixating the base, um, we would have, or we, we see a high tensile stresses um, to keep the apex in place, basically. Um, because we are, we, are, we are balancing that movement uh, of, the, of the apex towards the base only, we are constraining that only in basically a single point. Um, but if we use the pericardial boundary condition, um, that stress basically is distributed over a much, much larger surface and is not concentrated in a single area, if, uh, if that answers your question. Okay, thank you. There is another question by Mike Singer. Uh, do material properties of the heart influence selection of parameters associated with the boundary conditions? For instance, the spring constants. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so in our case, we used uh, the Holtz-Apfel exponential material model for the myocardium. And then we did a basically a parameter tuning where we looked at a ho whole range of pericardial stiffness parameters. And because that's a value that you cannot really um, determine experimentally because that in, the, in that one parameter, you have basically two effects. You have the stiffness of the pericardium, but you also have the elasticity of the surrounding tissue. And all those effects are basically combined into a single parameter, which is not really, does not really have something uh, related to it in reality. And so that's why we used a bunch of different parameters and uh, ran our simulation, uh, calibrated the parameters we wanted to calibrate with that new pericardial stiffness. Um, and then basically we looked at the outer shape of the heart and the atrioventricular plane displacement and basically picked the parameter where we got the best agreement between MRI and atrioventricular plane displacement. So, I, uh, so it's, and to come back to the original question, so in case you modify the stiffness parameters of the myocardium, I would suspect that you also need to do that recalibration again and it would slightly change. Um, from Marco Fedele, uh, who thanks you for the presentation and, and asks, what kind of boundary conditions do you use outside the pericardium? So for the veins and for the arteries yeah. and the outflow tract. Um, yeah. So in our case, uh, we actually included like um, parts of the great vessels going out of the heart um, because we wanted to impose as little artificial boundary conditions as possible or like to at least get the influence far away from our region of interest. And so here on the outside, we used um, omnidirectional springs, like springs that go in all directions, combined with also a, a dash pod um, to, to model any uh, viscous effects that you might have. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. So we have uh, a couple of minutes more, so uh, uh, I also ask a question. 
uh, I'd like to, to know whether you, uh, so you, you put the spring boundary conditions, but I'd like to know if it is just in the normal direction or also in the tangential, tangential direction. And second, uh, how do you deal with the twisting? I mean, because when the heart twists, uh, the normal direction changes. So if you account for this fact or use, or you use an, yeah. as, as an approximation the original direction. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so what we do, so the springs um, only go in normal direction. Um, so theoretically, uh, if you imagine the left ventricle to be a perfect ellipsoid, we would not constrain any twisting motion. Um, however, in the implementation of our spring boundary conditions, we make a simplification, and namely that we do not update this normal vector. So we only use the reference normal vector um, because it uh, saves a little bit of uh, computation time. Um, so that's an, like another inherent simplification. Um, but if you look at the other models that um, don't take that extra step to model that to model the interaction with a spring, but actually use contact interaction, um, they don't constrain the uh, rotational movement at all. So if you have a perfect ellipsoid in those cases, you could just freely rotate uh, the left ventricle. Okay. So thank you. Uh, there is a final question, so we can try to answer very quickly, and then uh, we will have to move in, in room A. So please. Uh, so the question is: in case of full bioventricular model only, so not considering atria, so just ventricles, uh, did you put pericardium boundary conditions up to the cardiac valve rings? Um, up to the valve rings. So in that case, you wouldn't really have the valve rings, right? If you just have the ventricles. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I think what you would have to do is, like you could apply the same pericardial boundary conditions on the outside of your biventricular model. But then you would, I guess, like some other sort of spring boundary conditions at the atrioventricular plane to basically model the elasticity of the two atria you would usually have on top. Um, I think people have done that as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Yeah.